So um, huge thanks to everyone again for joining us and those on the Twitter stream or on the um, uh, webcast as well. Um, I'm excited to, to just uh, turn things over here to, to John Palfrey who's going to moderate um, a panel focusing on um, sort of education, training, professional development, um, and uh, building capacity to, to work with all these sorts of things we've been talking about today. So um, turn it over and, and he'll sort of cue things up and introduce the panel. So thank you so much. Excellent. Trevor, thank you so much and uh, thank you to Maura Marks for inviting me and all of us here. Um, this panel is called Cultivating Digital Library Professionals. I think it's Maura's idea of a joke to have a non-library professional moderate this panel. Thank you, Maura. Um, but I'm delighted to have a chance to be here um, and uh, to spend time with this fabulous panel. Um, what we are going to do is have introductory statements by each of the four panelists, um, and then we will uh, have some, hopefully, discussion amongst the panelists and hopefully open it up for great follow-on questions from all of you. So get your ideas ready. Um, I think it makes sense for me just to introduce the group very quickly and then turn it right over to you guys because you're so awesome um, and we don't have that much time. Uh, Andromeda Yelton is the uh, owner of Small Beautiful Useful LLC, which is one of the best names of a company I've ever heard and fabulous. Um, I can't wait to hear more about it. Um, Bethany Novisky is the, uh, the director of the Digital Library Federation, and uh, uh, which, as everyone knows, is affiliated with the Council on Library and Information Resources. Um, Kim Schroeder is, is lecturer at Wayne State University in the School of Library and Information Science. Um, and Margot Padilla joins us as the Strategic Programs Manager from the Metropolitan New York Library Council. Uh, and we will go down the row this way, ending with Margot uh, in the cleanup spot. And uh, we will start with Andromeda. Over to you. Thank you, John. Um, I was going to talk today about why ongoing tech training is hard, the nuts and bolts of pedagogy, and what you can do to help. Maybe I still will in Q&A. Uh, but right now, <laughs> right now, 40 miles north of us, Baltimore is burning. Or it isn't. It is 10,000 people protesting peacefully against many years of secret violence, violence kept secret by habitual gag orders, with national media drawn like moths to the mere handful of flames. The stories I hear on Twitter are not the same as the stories on CNN. And we, as cultural heritage institutions, are about our communities and their stories, and about which stories are told, which are made canon, and how and why. So I want to talk about how technology training and digital platforms can either support or threaten our communities and their ability to tell their stories, and to have their stories reflected in the canonical story that we build when we build a national platform. I want to make it explicit that what we are doing in this room today is about deciding whose stories get told, by whom, and how. Whose are widely recognized as valid, and whose are samizdat, whose get to reach our corridors of power only through protest and fire. I was reminded this morning of an article co-authored by Myrna Morales, who was researching the Young Lords Party, which is a uh, political organization in her native Puerto Rico. And so she was looking through library-controlled vocabularies to see how she could find more information about it in the literature, and she couldn't find anything. And then with a sinking feeling, she thought, well, maybe she should check the header for gangs. And that was where she found information on this group. And I was reminded of a thing I did at a Harvard Library Cloud hackathon earlier, Intersectional Library Cloud where I looked at the most popular elements um, circulated in Harvard using the stack score in their API, and I looked at whether they also had subject headers that reflected women's studies or LGBT studies or African American studies um, using code and metadata as a way to surface what people learn matters when they're doing scholarship and learning at one of the most famous institutions on earth. Uh, TLDR it didn't really turn out to matter. <laughs> um, they're not reading about stuff like that when they're reading the things that they mostly read at Harvard. So the way that we structure our metadata, the content we seek, the tools we give people for interrogating the platform, whom we empower to use these tools and add this content and teach about these tools and construct them, how many they are, how diverse they are, have these profound effects on which stories that we advance and we say matter as cultural heritage institutions, which in turn shapes the present and the future. 
I've said before that libraries are about transforming people through access to information and each other, and that's true. But today I'm thinking more about what we can do to let more people transform libraries and how libraries and our content and APIs and platforms can be tools for more people to transform each other. How the metadata that courses through digital platforms is the frame we have to tell and interpret stories and how therefore as metadata creators we must be consciously inclusive. And how when we train librarians to use and create national digital platforms, we can train them to use these skills in a contextually aware way, not just to understand technology and use it, but to interrogate it and construct it from a critical perspective. To see how technology interacts with our communities and their stories, and where those gaps are, and how we can be part of bridging them. Because here we are, comfortable and safe and supplied with coffee, mostly white, talking about how millions of dollars should be spent, and Baltimore is convulsed by its history and by the blind eyes so many of us have turned to it. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, my message is going to be pretty simple and I think it will inevitably in the last panel of the day reinforce a lot of the things that we've already heard. I also think it still dovetails nicely um, with, uh, with Andromeda's uh, sort of welcome intervention because what I'm talking about too is community. And the message is this, that we need to put as much energy into connecting and building up groups of people into developing and supporting the motivated, skilled, diverse and intersecting communities of expert practitioners that we have, as we do into connecting the services, the systems, and the corpora that are the other pillars of a national digital platform. So the first thing that should come into many institutions is not another technology component uh, that you have to support, but rather a functioning social conduit to a broader supportive culture that understands digital library workers and that values the various communities that they inhabit and intersect with and are inspired by. Um, so I see the continuous renewal and expansion of expert practitioner communities as our most fundamental sustainability issue. It's the one on which all the others depends. And I'm consciously using the word community here rather than calling this our digital library workforce or similar, um, even though I know that there's some danger that such a happy sounding word could make us elide difficult, often gendered uh, labor issues in the discussion. But I do it for two reasons. And first, it's because it helps us scale up a conversation that is too often about local and individual professional development. And I also introduce it because of how it plays on individuals as a concept, right? So understanding that you are part of a community changes your ethical orientation toward your colleagues, your users, your shared work. Most of all, it sharpens your sense of uh, fut futurity, your inclination to look beyond immediate horizons and to consider the much longer term. Communities, um, as we just heard, have prospect and retrospect. Um, they have futures and histories. They're predicated on mutual support and common faith and they have the capacity to draw together people at different career stages or with diverse professional identities and personal orientations toward user groups. And communities themselves set intellectual direction in ways that bear watching. So this is why funding programs that support projects at national scale need at the very least to stay plugged into the conversations of practitioner communities as those communities develop in their self-conception and as we hope they continue to develop demographically to better represent um, American society. Now, the first law for a funder in relation to this evolution may be do no harm. And this is perhaps to return to some of the concerns that we heard right off the bat this morning about um, these programs maybe inadvertently reinforcing a kind of totalizing homogeneity. At best though, being aware of how our various practitioner communities are evolving and where they may be stagnating could help agencies like IMLS make enabling investments at crucial moments. Now on the other hand, the trick for funders is how to support developer communities through programs that are necessarily and fruitfully user and project 
oriented. Um, so a lot of what I've been talking about sounds like the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Grants, which is a wonderful framework for supporting practitioners as individuals and cohorts. But how you tie programs like this to the infrastructure building um, that we're talking about today with this IMLS priority may not be immediately obvious. We know it's necessary, that's clear, um, because the best professional development and frankly the only meaningful community development comes through project-based learning involving real-world situations and collaborations. So, so one possibility is to infuse the spirit of those LB21 grants throughout IMLS, that is to require more strongly that professional development outcomes for grant participants and for their larger communities of practice be formally addressed in all of IMLS's programs. So if we agree that this is a crucial part of increasing our national capacity, it should be taken seriously in all of our grant applications and in all of our reports of outcomes. We know that much of the value um, of a funded project comes in around the edges of the core deliverable, and a requirement like this becomes a tool for individual staff members, for middle managers, to use to create healthier local institutional cultures. So want a grant? Show not only that you can get a worthwhile project done, but that the experience of working on it in community will positively impact the careers and the potential of your staff for years to come. Show awareness of how your people fit into and interface with and help advance expert communities of national and global scope. So uh, once again, being last panel of the day, I'm throwing out my presentation entirely. Um, but in digging around Hadi Trust last night, I was looking at early models for library and archival education. Uh, and they pretty much followed a model that we are very familiar with, which is lecture and practice. Uh, and as far as how we take our new skills to educate our students now that will be your employees soon, <coughs> Uh, it has been the challenge. So we know that there has to be some kind of hybrid between lecture and practice. How much practice, how much do they need to know in order to come in and be viable employees without extensive training? How much professional development will they need ongoing? How do you manage this? How many volunteer projects can students handle in the midst of getting a graduate education? So these are all things that we are really struggling with in our field uh, and we have uh, great discussions at the faculty meetings about this. So my proposal really is that no, though none of our traditional skills can slide and we're adding new skills all the time, I would propose that we just double curriculum. So that's pretty much it. Um, obviously, it was a joke, um, obviously financially we can't do that to the students, so trying to figure out how to teach them to really execute the research methods in a lab is really vital for uh, feasibility for us to be able to understand interoperability, to understand how to patch together various systems to allow your metadata to stream through, how to build digital preservation into the management of your assets. It's really a humongous challenge uh, and I think that we definitely need more insight into discussions like this, so I will thank IMLS for hosting us today but also the library schools, archival institutions, and allied educational organizations need to discuss further what we need. Not that we're gonna have a great standardization, but uh, we need to better understand what we're providing our students and what they come to a potential job uh, enabled to do. So we need to speak to students, we need to speak to employers, and among ourselves in education, we need to do more talking, definitely. Um, and if I could, just for a minute, uh, and I will repeat this into the microphone so that the audio folks won't be mad at me, but I would be really interested to know if you could just shout out what kind of skills you would really like to have a new employee uh, walk in the door with at your institution. Being an effective reference person. Effective <laughs> reference, okay. Anybody else? Willingness to learn with whoever you're helping. And fearless. And, and, and entrepreneurial spirit. 
Entrepreneurial spirit, definitely something we like to garner. Curious. Curious? Okay. Solid, <laughs> solid communication skills. Margo said lift 45 pounds. What about, what about, yeah. <laughs> what about project management or managing technology? I mean, that's something that we're very interested in. Um, I, I like f Fearless. I'm teaching a class this summer where we're going to really take apart uh, a Linux server and work at installing a lot of different pieces that have been mentioned today. Um, and have them understand what that entails. Um, and that it's not, um, that you still have a do-over if it doesn't work the first time, because I think there's a lot of intimidation. Um, so those kinds of new skills, understanding linked data, I have students come to me all the time and say, well, what, which programming language should I take? I obviously cannot answer that question for them. It depends what they want to do with their career. Um, but the bottom line, as far as teaching some of this technology, is that the students have to be able to demonstrate to you that they can learn technologies. And so that's from the, from the education standpoint what we're trying to build within our students, that they can learn the technologies because, as you all know, it's unlikely you will find one person with every single technology skill and traditional skill in a job posting. But if they have an allied skill, an allied competency in another technology, you know they're trainable and that they will be able to pick that up and be effective with it. So we have a lot of challenges, and I really think we need to do larger surveys with employers and students and the educational community to understand what it is, our, what our end goal is. So that's all I have for today. Um, so I'm the program director for the National Digital Stewardship Residency in New York, and I'm here to talk about the program, which uh, I think attempts to address some of the issues that have already been brought up. Uh, the program was developed to cultivate the next generation of digital stewards by placing recent master's degree recipients in host institutions and having them work on a significant digital stewardship project. The program is currently being implemented in Washington, D.C., Boston, New York, and soon will be a virtual program administered by WGBH and uh, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. The program is still fairly new. We have um, 20 residents and all that have uh, so far gone through the program. So we're still learning what some of the issues are, but we have accomplished many of our goals. The goal of the program is to act as a bridge for students coming out of graduate programs to further equip them with the skills they need, not only to be competitive in the job market, but also to have a meaningful impact on digital stewardship and to become leaders in the field. The program also strives to place residents in organizations where they can really boost the entire program and help the organization get to the next level in its digital preservation long-term goals. For our projects, we tend to look for um, intellectual engagement um, for the resident, but also lots of hands-on work. Uh, we really want them to get their hands dirty. We also look for projects that address issues faced by organizations nationwide. So for example, in the current round in New York, we're dealing with providing access to born digital records, uh, long-term preservation of scientific data, and quality assurance measures for web archiving. So when the residents uh, arrive, we have two to three days of initial instruction, and we do digital preservation basics to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And we also work on their project management skills. After that, we have one to two workshops uh, per month, and those are really hands-on and immersive. Um, after, um, at, during this time, the residents are also regularly presenting on their work, uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, and actively participating in the digital stewardship community established by the program and by the host institution. So every host institution commits at least one mentor uh, to the resident, and this may be someone who may or may not have a strong digital preservation background, but we really like to have someone in the resident's corner who can help them navigate the ins and outs of the institution. A lot of times these residents are implementing new procedures and policies, and they need someone to help them sort of navigate the waters. The mentor is also there to uh, guide the resident through experimentation, through pitfalls, um, helping them expand the skills that they bring to the residency and acquire those that they still need. Uh, one of the strongest elements of the program is the cohort model. Um, so the cohorts come to work off of each other's skills and connections, and we really aim to have past, present, and future cohorts networked and talking and exchanging ideas. And this is sort of where we start to think about scaling up the NDSR program. 
NDSR definitely has the potential to become a collection of these one-off projects, so we're trying to stay focused on the big picture. How does NDSR leverage funding that goes to a particular iteration of the program towards building a national capacity? So one of the small steps we've taken in that direction is requiring the residents to create reports and documentation of their process um, and what worked and what didn't so that other organi organizations can, uh, that are addressing those issues can replicate it for themselves. Uh, another way is, again, focusing on the residents. Uh, they gather for their time in the program and then proceed to get jobs throughout the country. By keeping all the cohorts networked, they become this incredibly skilled and well-connected community, helping each other with problems, helping each other identify opportunities, and sometimes just offering words of encouragement. Establishing a community for recent graduates can help us retain some of the talent that might otherwise leave our field by making them feel invested and committed and even special. When so many jobs are short-term or temporary, NDSR can help anchor new professionals. The program continues to evolve and we will be welcoming new cohorts uh, this year and uh, I know we look forward to integrating a lot of what has been uh, brought up today. Thank you guys very much. This was a terrific, terrific range of viewpoints on this broad and important question. Um, I have two things that I wanted to ask, um, but I see that Mike has got his hand up right now, so I'm going to defer to Mike and I'm going to fold in my questions as we go. So since there is a fabulous question, no doubt, in the front row, let's go there. No, no, jump right in. Yeah, that will be helpful. You were so quick on the draw, Micah, that Katie will get there. So I'm going to confess a personal vi bias in this question as someone who has spent six wonderful years working in library and does not have a library degree. And I've often wondered if I need to go back and get one to ever be a legitimate library worker. And so my question is, uh, and you know, many librarians have counseled me, no, don't do that. And yet at the same time, I can say as someone who is not a librarian, that's a caveat on every idea I have and everything I say. And you know, this is taking on an unnecessary personal dimension, but I guess my, my question is, um, you know, I think that it's right, part of the problem of professional development is clearly about expanding the set of skills that you impart to library school grads. Uh, another question and idea is what about imparting some basic concept of libraries to grads from law school, business school, design school, you know, computer programming grads. So just one example of the kind of thing. Um, I don't have a business degree, but I worked at McKinsey for four years and they have this thing they call a mini MBA, which is three weeks that is allegedly supposed to give you the highlights of what you would have gotten in two years of business school. A little bit insulting to anyone that took business school seriously, but I wonder about you know, a mini LLM or a mini library degree for people who bring something valuable from another discipline but want to know more about library school and what they would have learned there but aren't quite willing to go back to night school for three years to do it. Um, so do you have thoughts on how you can embrace more deeply other than librarians and archivists as legitimate and contributing library workers? Go for it. Should I go? Please. Uh, well, one of the things that we are all, you know, in recognition of is that everything we do is collaborative, and so we need people with various perspectives. So I don't have any urge for a very homogeneous uh, discipline uh, or execution of our projects. I don't think that would be um, the best uh, use of our time. I, mean, I, being an educator, yes, I would love for you to come get your MLIS. You know, that would be great. Uh, but I also understand finances and time, and once you already have a career and out there, there's a lot of other things to do with your time. But I think that you can get at some of that through the collaborations that you do. Uh, and I certainly, I don't have a technology degree, but I spend a lot of time with tech people trying to absorb as much as I can. So um, I I don't feel bad they don't have a tech degree, and I hope they don't feel bad they don't have an MLIS. So, you know, I think that we just learn from each other, and I think that makes us richer. Kim, could you, uh, do you offer, or could you imagine a mini three-week intensive, you know, MLIS sort of thing, much as McKinsey does in the business side, and do you do anything that is uh, distance learning? So could Micah from New York um, be at Wayne State in any way to get his mini degree? Um, I, I could envision that, actually, and we have a very entrepreneurial uh, management there, so I will take that back and ask them about it, honestly. Um, and we do have an online program for our digital curation folks, not for our archives, but program yet. But, uh, you know, so there are definitely things that you can do online. 
a short while into my time as a library director without a library degree, I found myself in Jim Neal's office at Columbia, and he taught me the term feral. He told me I was a feral librarian. And feral professional and that it was fine and not to worry too much about it. So anyway, but I do think that you might find um, that Micah's idea would both be a business opportunity for some leading iSchools and library schools, but also something that would actually meet a need that's slightly different than somebody going back, you know, for two or three years to, to do, do a full-on degree that actually might expand the network of people involved. But yes, please. I'm Dan Bell. I'm assuming that I am here as the past president of the Society of American Archivists and not because I work at the Library of Congress, but at six of one, half a dozen of another. One, I do want to mention that the Society of American Archivists does offer a, pro a digital archivist certification program um, to become a digital archive specialist, nine, program nine courses, and then you take a test. So that would be an option. If we're looking at professional development, it sounded very much as if some of the presentations that were being discussed were for new professionals, not for those of us who have years in the profession. Second, to respond to the idea of a, two, of a course that someone could take and become um, someone with a degree, well, be the equivalent of someone with an MLIS or you know, get these, those, those activities. For a long time, um, the National Archives and Records Administration offered a two-week program called the Modern Archives Institute where you learned the basic skills so that you were prepared. There are other versions of it known as the Western Archives Institute. Um, there's one that's done in the South. Um, NAR's not offering it anymore, but there are those options out there that are available. Um, I do want to go back to something that happened earlier this morning about how you can reach the users. Um, I primarily work with teachers, and they're the ones who we discovered when we put out American Memory, our number one user group was teachers. We're not talking to the teachers, we're not talking to the folklorists who um, are reaching out into the communities, and we should be doing that as we should be doing that as well. And last thing, I do want to respond to Andromeda and something that she said. Um, how many of you have family members that are in Baltimore? I do. I spent a lot of time talking to my mom last night, who lives about 20 minutes away from where all this was happening, and. Um, I'm feeling a little bit of frustration towards some of what Andromeda was saying because, yeah, Baltimore was burning, but I think there's some reasons why beyond just the anger and frustration of a person being involved in police custody. Do you want to say more on that topic since it's the issue of the day for all of us? Um, I will be honest. My, I am not conservative. My mom is. but. The thing, the thing that frustrates me about some of this is that the African American community is destroying its own community. They're not going and storming City Hall. They're not going and doing things like that. They burned down a senior center that was being built to support the seniors in the community. They went in and looted the CVS that everyone was talking about before they burned it down. They're destroying their own communities. They're not, they're not saying, hey, come and help us. It's happened, it happened in Los Angeles. It happened with the riots after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And my concern is that, all right, yeah, there are problems in the African American community. There's been anywhere from 50 to 80% 80, 80 unemployment for African American males. There was an article in the Washington, not Washington Post, the New York Times about the disappearing African American male and that more and more and more African American males are either incarcerated or dying. But the community that's out there is destroying itself, not just the majority community destroying the African American community. So I have major fears when my 81-year-old mother, I'm calling her and going, do I need to come up and get you because you're 10 minutes away from where they're burning things down?
and you live in the roughest part of Baltimore City, the, one of the highest crime rates, one of the largest drug communities. So um, my concern is we're not, I mean, if we're talking about how we're supporting the community, we're looking, we're not, look, we need to be looking at the libraries. I mean, Ferguson opened its library. The two libraries that I went to as a kid are both closed, that are both in this major area are both closed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pratt's, Pratt's open, but the branches are not. that are in my community, for sure one is shuttered. I'm pretty sure the other one is mm. too. Thank you. And, that, and that's, as I said, 10 minutes away from where my mom lives, also not far away from where the burning is taking place. Thank you. I saw a few hands, but Andromeda, did you want to say, say more on that? I don't think I can add anything to the voice of someone who actually has lived in the city. I haven't. Thank you. Uh, Jim, did you want to say anything, or is it about the Pratt? No, it's uh, I was raising a different question. Yes, sir. Okay. So librarianship is one of the uh, few professions that generally does not require uh, continuing education or any level of certification for its uh, its members, if you will. There are exceptions, health sciences, law, but for the most part, we do not have that expectation. We may have that expectation, but we don't have that requirement. Could you speak to that in terms of whether this is something we need to begin to work on as a community? Well, I think there would be advantages and severe disadvantages to, uh, to instituting something like ongoing certification. Um, the, the advantages would be um, scale and scope, right? You, you reach everybody, it's part of the culture, it's part of what's done, and there's no chance of remaining um, working in libraries without, uh, without keeping your skills up without, right? But there are other, other vectors to, to taking care of that problem. When I look at that, a suggestion like that, I think about um, a school teacher sort of re-upping certification and so forth, and um, and all of the, it's not a it's not a it's not a sort of nimble system. It's not a system that is very easy to sort of intervene in to advance. The very often, um, you know, a big sort of slow moving system like that reifies a decade ago's, you know, cutting edge, right? And so, um, so do we want to, um, to set up a sort of formal re-upping of certification or do we want to depend on the kind of user communities and, and sort of practitioner communities that I'm talking about to be a little narrower, to be a little more specific, and to be a lot more uh, sort of current in what it is that they're teaching each other. Um, that's, that's probably where I would invest rather than in, um, in, a, in something more formal. Bethany, you talked in an elegant way about the notion of project-based learning as mm -hmm. something that would be helpful in the context of learning the set of digital library skills. Yeah. Could you imagine marrying that idea to Jim's in some fashion to come up with a series of projects that need working on that would, oh, yeah, in essence, be something that somebody might <laughs> right. do as ongoing training in some fashion? Right, so, so I'm, um, I'm pretty new to the Digital Library Federation. I've um, been there a week and a half, you can tell, because I have no stickers on my laptop yet. Um, but, we'll but see you in a year, and I'm sure they'll be packed. <laughs> but I'm stickers. sure, no doubt, um, especially after having said that. Um, I have a DPLA one right in my I know, I want it. Um, but, uh, but before that, um, I spent 20 years at the University of Virginia working in the digital humanities community and most recently directing the Scholars Lab and its graduate fellows programs, which um, over the years have evolved from solo fellowships for dissertating graduate students working in the digital humanities to team-based and project-based fellowships. Um, the Praxis program is one of those. And we watched, because the Scholars Lab as a, as a digital humanities center is administratively embedded in a library all along um, we were thinking and talking with librarians about how, how do you move that outward, um, how do you apply that kind of uh, interdisciplinary cohort-based um, learning that happens around a real-world project. So these are fellowships that graduate students get to, um, to join a cohort of five other um, grad students, all from different disciplines, to conceive of 
prototype, launch, and assess um, a software project in the course of a year, right? So they really are thrown into the deep end. Um, it's been really neat to see that concept spread out to other libraries. So Columbia's developing librarian um, program, UVA is exploring a praxis for librarians. So just that, that model as our graduate students um, finished up and moved on many, if not most of them, into libraries and cultural heritage institutions rather than into the professoriate. Um, uh, taking that kind of concept with them. So yeah, I do think that's a professional development model that, that has legs and it also can get things done. Awesome. Kim or Margaret, did you want to respond to, to Jim's question about certification and so forth? Um, yeah, just I'm not ready yet to throw in the towel on um, the library schools. I think there's still ways to sort of um, develop what they're doing there, um, maybe through cohorts or through um, specialized tracks um, before you start requiring additional education um, once you've already invested in the IMLS. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, so this is uh, Trevor Munoz. Um, so I guess I would be curious to have the panel re reflect a little bit more on working with sort of library or museum leadership about sort of who they see as part of the potential cohorts for these, um, you know, opportunities for further development. Because I think some of the leadership, leadership of these organizations sees certain parts of their staff as maybe more ready or more um, able to go out and be part of something that, say, the DLF would do. <laughs> Um, and are maybe not looking at, say, like their cataloging department with the same kind of eyes. Um, and I wonder if you could sort of talk about that challenge, about helping these institutions reimagine with their staff who are already there, kind of who maybe are not as comfortable sort of self-identifying or self-promoting about being ready for change, but who are ready for change. Well, I might jump in. Please um, do to say that subject librarians are another um, another one of those uh, cohorts that often don't get that kind of attention or aren't assumed to um, to want to leap in. And that's why I'm attracted to this model of uh, sort of investing in expert practitioner communities and really letting them define intellectual direction and, um, and help us see what they see as their user communities and what they see as their, um, as their sort of, their communities, right? Because that often will include people from other sectors of the library, people um, in scholarly communities that use these resources or help build these tools and want to define them. Um, so that, that's my sort of off the cuff response is that um, I think we don't, uh, we don't ask the, those, those smaller groups that we very often target for this kind of, uh, you know, praxis program-like experience, we don't often ask them in setting something like that up, who do you want to pull in? Who do you, who do you need? Um, this is not going to work unless you bring in who? Tell us. On a smaller scale, we have a digital media projects lab uh, at our school, and we use it to outreach to our community. So uh, we have, you know, a reel-to-reel -reel audio conversion system, lots of audio, lots of video, other video formats. And when we work with uh, smaller museums and other cultural institutions, um, they pretty much let us lead everything because they're so understaffed. So, you know, we've been talking about the big scale, but on the smaller scale, they're so grateful for a graduate student, the equipment, all of that to be dispensed. They, they often don't know what to ask for, so they don't realize they need a digital preservation plan. They just know they needed something digitized. So we try to use that as a teaching moment to sort of ratchet up. Um, and educate them about managing their digital and how they're creating access and long-term preservation. I wonder if I could take an example from the previous panel and then put it back to you guys as a specific, which is, I was struck by Trevor Munoz describing the idea of metadata mobs and why we didn't necessarily have more people 
in that kind of mode working on collaborative projects. And I've often actually thought about this too. If you were to compare, for instance, what happens with Wikipedia, the number of people who contribute meaningfully to that, the notion of Wikimania, the idea that you have a bunch of people coming together and geeking out, improving articles and meeting on an annual basis. Um, and uh, in the context of DPLA, we've tried to do a version of that with DPLA Fest. But it's definitely not you know, thousands of librarians rolling up their sleeves and like adding metadata, which I think it could be. And if you think about you know, how many potential potential people could participate in this, whether it's library students, active librarians, retired librarians, and so forth, why don't we have metadata mobs? Um, and if that actually is potentially something that we would want, and I embrace Trevor's suggestion, I think it's a great one, what's between here and there? And is it that we need to change the culture of the community, to take your term, Bethany? Is it that there's more we could do in library schools? Is it more that we could do in um, programs like um, the one that Margo's running? Is it possibly that professional development needs to be more? What is it, what's standing between us and really, really productive <coughs> metadata mobs and coding groups developing, you know, huge new open source projects. Why haven't those things happened in the library community? Or how, maybe a better way, how do we get to the place where they are, assuming that's a good thing? Well, well we have 120 years of library education behind us, and these are um, paradigm shifts. And we have to do more talking, we have to do needs assessment, we have to create structure in order to uh, gather the information, we have to, again, survey the population, whether they're users, employers, students, et cetera. So there's a lot of work to be done, much as we talked about earlier today. So I don't think there's a lack of will. Mm -hmm. I think that most institutions are just trying to survive in their world, and it comes back to an earlier point, which is that there's not the national drive to fix this uh, typically as there is within your own institution. As someone who right now runs a 237-year-old school, I often think about this problem, which is how hard is it to change something that's been doing something really well for a long time? And I would say, you know, in libraries, it's obviously been a real success story, particularly in this country, um, but it is something that I think needs to change. And so I'm taking that your point being that 120 years is actually a challenge as much as it is a positive in, in this context, right? Andromeda? Yeah, I think there are three things that immediately spring to mind. One is that uh, if you propose some kind of, of service or activity in libraries, there's a lot of people who will instantly ask, um, what's your plan for making it sustainable for all of time? Um, not everything has to be. And you'll never do a metadata mob if you have to have a plan to do it every week for all of time. Um, another reason, uh, or something that, that um, I think does a good job of dealing with that mindset is the fourth floor in the Chattanooga Public <laughs> Library, which is constructed very intentionally as a space for prototyping new services. And it's okay for things to happen there once and fail and not move on, but it's also okay for things to be found useful there and to spread out throughout the system. So I think sometimes you have to be really explicit about creating a space where things can fail and you can sustain that space, but then you hand wave the things in it. Um, another reason is things like metadata mobs and, and tech sprints and stuff are really high touch. It's not, you're not going to get them if you just wait for a bunch of people to self-organize for the most part. You really need people setting priorities and providing resources. Um, Grow Stuff is an open source project that does a great job of organizing sprints in atomic ways that let people show up for a weekend and do stuff, uh, but they work at it. <laughs> um, and the other issue is, is workplace time and support. Uh, I just uh, came out with a library technology report on librarians who write code at work. Uh, you can download it for free from ALA Tech Source. Um, and I asked them, you know, Say how much- more slowly, Andromeda. <laughs> Where do you download ALA it ALA Tech Source. Awesome. The, or it's at journals.ala.org. Anyway. Um, and I asked librarians, you know, did you get support from your workplace in learning how to code? And many of them said yes. And I asked, what form did that support take? And they said, basically, they didn't actively stop me from doing it. <laughs> I'm like, your bar is set a little low, right? <laughs> so if we're talking about if, if we're talking about people learning to use and employing tech skills in a way that's like, go to your full-time job, which has no time allocated to do this, come home, make dinner, put the kids to bed, do your chores, it's 9 p.m., now you can learn to code. <laughs> this is made a fail. That's <laughs> after library school, right? Yeah, 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 yeah after yeah, that yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a thing where a place like Imlis has a real advantage because it has a name and resources to, to convince people to spend time at work on work things involving change. Did I see a hand up here? 
or whoever has a mic. Yes. Oh, I, I can go and I can pass it to Catherine. That after. sounds perfect. Um, Why don't we do that? And so, um, and drama, you had jumped into some of this, um, and I wanted to thank you for your your sort of diversion um, to to take us through the the Baltimore considerations. But I also wanted to make sure that you had time to share some of the um, other issues that you've started to jump into. But I think part of this gets at a real challenge around how we change the conception of what um, what labor is in this environment. And I think the trick, like. Funding projects is one thing, but in, in another environment, there's sort of a culture shift about what being a professional means in terms of having that time and that space as part of your job to say that, you know, I need to be learning. I mean, as an example, when um, one of the developers working on Zotero decided he needed to use a different framework, he said, I need to take three work weeks to learn it before I'm going to implement it. And everyone said, of course, that's exactly what you do as a developer. You go and you do exactly that sort of thing. So I'm curious for the group's thoughts about how sort of cultural, professional sort of labor issues, um, what needs to happen there and how do we get there? Um. Who would like at it? Margo, since you've been quietest for the while, you have first oh, crack at it if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have thoughts at this at this moment. Fair um, enough, you <laughs> passing is absolutely accepted, but we'll uh, come back to you. So it, it made all the difference in the world, I think, for the Scholars Lab as a library embedded kind of R&D space when I really instituted and started to protect 20% uh, R&D time on the old Google model for all staff. And that was all staff across the board. It didn't matter what projects you were working on. The departmental assistant had the ability to call on this time. Now we had to do, um, you know, we, there were there were um, there were rules that came with um, that kind of exploratory freedom. The idea was for everybody to be able to take a half step back from all of the demands being placed on them um, for working with faculty on projects, for working on internal infrastructure projects, for all of the data migrations and uh, sort of moving content forward that we had inherited from uh, decades of digital work at UVA, take, take a step back to be able to, A, breathe, and B, um, look at the commonalities among these requests and maybe, uh, maybe invent something that addressed more than what they were being asked for and solved, solved some problems. So that, that was the concept. Um, some of the, the ground rules um, that I sort of uh, set around this included um, that anybody who was taking advantage of R&D time needed to be able at the drop of a hat to say what it is that they're working on and make a kind of compelling case for how it, um, it met the mission in some loose way of the Scholars Lab, of the library, of the University of Virginia. Um, so you had to connect it and you had to be able to speak compellingly about it. And, um, and really the other sort of base requirement was that there be some visible outcomes so that, um, that you were publishing whatever that meant for the project that you're working on. So sometimes this was, um, you know, the, your, your vector was GitHub. Sometimes your vector would be a conference presentation. There were books that came out of this. There were lots of, um, lots of different kinds of um, sort of published formal uh, accessible outcomes. And, um, and what we found was really quickly that the projects that emerged did meet broad needs. So things like Blacklight came from, um, from Scholars Lab R&D time, from, you know, uh, so take a break, Bess, and, uh, and tinker around with this and, um, and think about it. You know, that, that was the seed of, um, of some, some projects that really radically changed the way our library operates, that opened up possibilities for collaboration um, with other groups. And, um, and the Neatline project was another one of those that was an R&D. Um, project. So, um, so th and that's kind of an answer to the previous question yeah. too, which is just time, right? Mm -hmm. It's time, and we um, and we kind of get ourselves into the mindset that we need to fill every possible moment, um, and don't give our staff enough enough time to sort of breathe and be creative and um, and really exercise those entrepreneurial skills that we've been talking about, and put, you know, put things that they've learned to use. 
I'm often struck by the fact that there are 125,000 or more libraries in the United States, obviously a lot of them school libraries, and if you just thought about even a tiny bit of time from one person in each of those libraries contributing to a set of public spirited projects, yeah. there'd be a huge amount of kind right. of person power mm -hmm. to, to put to bear yeah. um, out there. Uh, please. Yeah, I want to say I love the idea you just threw out, John. Um, but I also want to go back to some of the things that we were talking about on the panel earlier today on the GAPS panel. And specifically rewinding back to two questions which continue to come to me as I'm hearing you guys talk. So we've got this kind of identity crisis that I think is going on. It's been going on for a long time, um, which doesn't make it any less important now. It makes it more important now. And I think that same identity crisis that's there in libraries, archives, and museums themselves is also there in the iSchools and in the you know, few museum school programs that are there in the professional development opportunities, et cetera. And until we figure out how we're gonna define what our mission is, it becomes really, really hard to teach people to go in that direction. And so I wanna challenge us to walk back a few steps. And I know ALA is working on some uh, master language right now around what, what libraries are and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, one of the problems in our field is that there aren't clear hierarchies that can tell us what these things are. And so we have to figure out ways to facilitate voices from the community and synthesize that up and then act on it. And so I want to start there just as a, you know, who are we and how does that impact what answers we can give to where education needs to go. So we'll definitely come back to that as a pause, yep. but keep going. Okay, yep. and then the second piece is the who is collaborating. So again, you know, coming back to the second thing that I introduced on the gaps, where are the bridges and where are the bridges missing? And right now, one of the critical bridges that I see missing, not just as the executive director of Educopia, where I'm trying to work between groups, but also as an adjunct professor at SJSU, where I've been teaching for a number of years in their digital preservation course, mostly to keep my own skills honed, my students force me to. Um, in that course, one of the things that I've been able to do is you know, tell my students, go out and do a digital preservation plan. Um, and I've done this assignment for about five years, and it's something that I came up with because I'm a practitioner who then came into, I wasn't, I wasn't trained in library science, I was, you know, that was not my background. I was a practitioner and I came into the classroom and I brought into the classroom practice and said, all right, you can partner with anybody. You can, comp you can part partner with a construction company, Charles B. Schultz Museum, Aquarium, whatever, and my students have done all of those and more. And they've had these incredible experiences. It's led to internships, it's led to jobs. They're real success stories coming out of this. And so when I heard you guys talking earlier about you know, how do you start a metadata mob or something along those lines, I think one of the pieces that's broken is the piece between the iSchools and the practitioners, often in the same institution. So just in those ac academic settings alone, we've got some repair work that I think we need to do and some bridges that need to be built that could make it easier to envision the types of projects that, that maybe we're looking at. Sorry to go on awesome. for a long time, no, no, but those are my two. Two, two <laughs> fantastic substantive statements slash questions that both have, I think, a lot to go on. Um, uh, Tim Spaulding, by the way, from Twitter, points out that library thing is an example of a successful metadata mob, and there's some good, uh, some good um, Twitter chatter on that. But let's start with actually Catherine's first question, which is really the, the kind of fundamental one about the job description of libraries and the sort of shifting, um, developing identity of libraries and how that ties into the panel. And then secondly, we'll come to the who is collaborating question. So let's start with the, the fundamental, and then uh, we'll go to the secondary. Um, as far as collaboration, um, well you did so you're going to the second one, one first? That's <laughs> fine. You've done it. it. You go mind, for it. So. Go for it. Uh, well, Catherine, you and I have like minds. So um, I have always, in every class I've ever taught, introduced a hands-on project. I don't care if it was an introduction class. Uh, because I think that it gives students more confidence in interviewing. It adds to their resume. It helps them with their people skills. Um, and their professionalism. So, uh, so that's something that we're very adamant about. And, and um, when I took over the archival administration program, um, I, that came with it the practicums in both digital content management and archives. So we have that piece, but I also manage the digital media projects lab, which means I'm working with organizations like our Contemporary Arts Museum, et cetera, in the area, um, and Detroit Sound Conservancy, Detroit Historical Museum, to, to provide help to them and also skills for the students. And they get a lot more out of that 
uh, pr in a professional sense than just specific hard skills. So there's a lot of soft skills that come with doing those projects. And it gives them something more to talk about and to research in the classroom as well. So I think that's really, really critical. Um, and then we've also got the alternate spring break where they often travel to um, the National Archives or Presidential Library, et cetera, for a week of intensive. So I'm really adamant about the experiential training. Um, and, and my issue, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is I'm not sure where to even cut it off. I mean, I have some students that will just doggedly, whatever I post that I need a volunteer for, they're there every time, and I'm worried, I, I say, no, school comes first. You have to pass first. <laughs> but, you know, how far do you go? But it's really critical. Those are the students that get the jobs as soon as they graduate, you know, the ones that have the hands-on in addition. And, um, a and they sound dogged, like they yeah. actually work hard. <laughs> well, I have a, a colleague at Library of Congress, and he said to me, you know, this is we have a science-based discipline, and there is no other science where you don't experiment hands-on uh, to add to your education. So I think that's absolutely critical. From a collaborative standpoint, we are working, I am making as many connections as I can for my students, and we have some that have gone through the NDSR program, um, which is a fabulous program, um, and it's really important, but, but I, Everything we do is collaborative, and at the NDSA meeting a few years ago, they were talking about the blurring lines between librarianship, archives, and museum administration, and I think that's okay. I'm sorry, but the, because of the digital tools, the way we do our jobs is different. And that's okay. And every team I'm on for, for a large scale project has archivists, librarians, and technologists, and maybe museum curators. Everything I do is that way. And we do come at things a little differently, but we have some overlap in our skills that allows us to successfully institute projects. And I just think that's the way it's gonna be. And I, I think if we're too territorial, that's going to prevent us from success. Uh, is is because you are the exception. And so, I mean, the, the question of collaboration at Wayne State is a different question from the question of collaboration when you're not in Kim's class at Wayne State. <laughs> and, I, and I really do, I mean, I, I mean that both as a compliment and also as a, a challenge to all of us, you know, field wide, how do we, how do we turn that around? How do we build things that are more practicum oriented, like what Bethany was talking about, like what, um, Clear has done historically with the fellows program what uh, you know multiple NDSR you know there are lots of examples of this now both in an internship and residency sort of space but not so much in the classroom space and so thinking about how to forge those connections not just in the one-off instances like what I'm teaching or what you're teaching much more than I am but you know in in the system. You're welcome to treat that as a rhetorical question if you prefer not to come. <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, earlier one of our answers to our questions was narcissism. Um, my, my facetious answer right now is peer pressure, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I just think these discussions are, are the way to go. And I think when you have so many student successes uh, in also doing the hands-on, that, that that will get through to people. And it also means the students will choose where they go. Kim, your point earlier that many of your students are actually not going into the professoriate, though, is an interesting thing, which is if you're seeking to create more professors, although it's great to have practitioners, it'd be interesting to have some combo, or maybe there's a, a route back in some way to, to help populate the professoriate as well. So. Uh, Todd Carpenter with NISO. Uh, something that's been bouncing around on Twitter, uh, I kind of initiated um, in result to the 20%, the Google's 20% thing, it was actually 120%. <laughs> and this right. actually leads to my question, how do we as a community foster a culture that is professional development is part of the 100% that you give, not the 125% that you give. That it's part of your job to improve your skills and that the staff and the institution should benefit from you gaining more skills, then it's on you personally to do that little bit of extra to learn how to code using a MOOC in, you know, at two o'clock in the morning. After you put the kids to bed. After you put the kids yeah. to bed. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, so I'll tell you what I did. I think we're about to see whether it works or not since I left the institution, but what I did as a manager was I wrote it into people's job descriptions, which are broken down to be 100%, as something that, you know, if I got hit by a falling piano or whatever, um, they there would be a way for each individual staff member to go back and say, no, this is my job, R&D, for at least 20% of my time in my 40 hours a week is my job. And then what we did in terms of day-to-day -day practice was um, I never took it myself. I went around fending off um, demands to try to make it possible for people to really take advantage of it. And you know, people did that to, to greater and lesser degrees, but it, but it did help mitigate that risk that it could be, um, you know, we're asking people to perform beyond what is humanly possible to do. I think it's fundamentally about moving something from a peripheral activity to a core activity. Right. We did something very similar at Harvard Law School Library, and I think it's just about making administrative choices, right? right. You're going to spend less time on something else. And I think we joked about those things. I guess it was Kim saying that those skills that we no longer have to train for, but really, we do have to take right. stuff out to put this in, right. or it's I mean, not going to work. The important thing is that it becomes part of the culture, right. not just part of the job. And so it becomes part of the mindset. And and it, it, you know, that became something that attracted people um, to the group and something that helped retain them. So I yes. think also that uh, uh, great. Go, uh, professional development is something that's not lost on new professionals. Um, like I said, so many of the jobs that new professionals take are temporary, and so you're constantly training for your next job. And that's on your own time or hopefully supported by the institution. Um, but if you're talking about professional development being part of the culture, it's definitely part of the culture of being a new professional. You can't stop. And Dramani, you want to say something? Yeah, it's, it's not like you can't demonstrate concrete value for these skills if you're in a context where you really need to do that. I mean, the, the people who are writing the scripts and in my report, you know, Becky Yost wrote something that saved one to two weeks of cataloger time per year. So if you gave her a couple weeks to learn that skill, it paid off within a couple of years. Um, Eric Fetaplace wrote a thing that helped them deliver better reference statistics, and so they could go to their broader institution and say, we know that you don't know this and did not previously believe us, but now we can show you that like half our questions in the beginning of the semester are on tech support, and we need to staff and resource that because we are where your students learn to use their computers. You know, I, there's, um, Matthew Riedsma does these amazing things at Grand Valley State where he's like, oh, my system isn't usable. I'm going to write some JavaScript to entirely change the way that this vendor interface I basically can't customize actually works. Like, people do really <laughs> amazing things that make lives better in concrete ways if they have the skills to do it. And awesome. the time. Uh, last comment. And the time. Yeah. Um, Michael Edson uh, again. Um, a couple things. One is I think we can't neglect um, the fact that we need to train managers, train management, train leaders um, on change. This is going to be the accelerating pace of cultural and technological change is going to be with us for a really long time. And we, as, a, as a community, I think we suck at it. <laughs> and other industries, other professions are running circles around us. You walk into, in my job, I've had the privilege of sitting down with a lot of teams talking about change. And I've gotten to the point where you can sort of see the habits and you can see if the vocabulary is there or not. And sometimes you just have to fold up your laptop and listen quietly. So this is a huge, huge issue. I hear it from um, entry-level professionals all the time. We need to train our top leaders how to change. Um, the other thing is I think it's really great to be talking about optimizing training and professional development for professionals. But I think we need to think more expansively about who we want as library practitioners in the same way that um, uh, the web has opened up new kinds of curation, new people who can participate in the creation of knowledge and the curation of knowledge. Um, we can have an existing cadre of library professionals who are better than the ones we have now through training. Don't we also want you know, 10 million citizen librarians from 200 countries also doing that work? I suspect they're already doing it, um, you can turn them into a movement. Uh, you can help them be successful in their own communities. That's probably a really great outcome for society. And I don't want this project to lose sight of that. 
Excellent. I take that to be a statement, not a question. And we have two minutes until we will turn it over to the Archivist of the United States. Is there so a I question? Wonder, well, can, yeah, can we you, first, we you have one question hanging yes, out there. Yes, please. I was going to give you a last chance. But uh, <laughs> hang on one sec, Bethany. You'll get your last chance. There's one more comment, it sounds like, from the uh, crew. And then you'll each have a chance to do a 30-second cleanup. Okay. Oh, okay uh, very quickly. Alan from, from ALA. Uh, so going back to the national digital platform, since that implies a very different kind of orientation, developing you know, systems or applications that will be uh, useful throughout the country as opposed to focusing on what's useful for your own library. Uh, just to have, uh, does the panel have any thoughts in terms of what that means for what kind of education we'll need for professionals going forward? Uh, the other quick comment is, uh, in, in my work, we also uh, focus on national policy advocates, so people who could testify at Congress or, uh, as Micah mentioned, uh, people who might uh, negotiate uh, licenses with, with publishers at, the, at a national scale. Uh, and uh, going forward, I think we're going to need just you know, more people like that to engage with the, the, the world beyond libraries. And so uh, any thoughts or just putting that on the table in terms of people, uh, education and training we'll need going forward. Thanks, Alan. So in roughly a tweet or two length, um, do you guys want to <laughs> give last comments? We'll go Margo and end up with Andromeda. And Bethany, you can hit whatever you want on the way past. Um, I think just for the last two comments, um, one of the most significant investments we can make is in developing new professionals, um, um, hiring them permanently and training them to become managers. And, in, and as far as um, schools go, um, training them not on a specific programming language or something that is sort of will disappear, but on how to think about these problems. So developing a digital preservation plan will will never get stale. You know, so thinking um, not not necessarily always hands-on skills, but how to think through problems. Um, that that's a skill that will last um, throughout one's career. I would definitely have to agree. Uh, having a business background, I use those skills constantly in managing these large projects and uh, assembling volunteers, and just knowing how to do a budget, project management, and, and uh, needs assessment. All of those those skills are really important, and they're going to continue to be really important for what we're doing because we're looking at larger scales, more integration, and more globality in what we do and how we share information. So I wanted to address the identity crisis question because it came up earlier um, today, and it kind of bugged me then too. You know, the, so the question is, um, for for libraries, archives, and museums, and I schools, how do we define what our mission is? How do we make it compelling? How do we attract new practitioners? Um, I want to resist a single answer to that. I think what makes a message about libraries compelling is that it speaks to people's own experiences and to their personal missions. And, uh, and because we are many, I feel like there's not a single value proposition there, but what we want to do is create frameworks that help us voice those to different practitioner communities and user groups. Excellent. I guess my two-tweet summary is that supporting professional development has a multiplier effect on the value of all the platforms that you invest in. Um, and enabling the people who create and use and teach your platforms to think critically about the intersection of society and technology makes the technology more inclusive and valuable. One can tell that that Andromeda is a true tweeter. Well done. <laughs> um, I hope you'll join me in thanking this panel for a great, great time. Thank you.